Why is marijuana against the law? It grows naturally upon our planet. Doesn't the idea of making nature against the law seem to you a bit paranoid? Tell me, nature, how do you make nature against the law? It grows everywhere. Okay, hey there, hello everybody, and welcome to our ninth year of Hempology 101 lectures here yeah! at the University of Georgia. Thank you, and, and thank you for tracking us down. I realize the posters say uh, we should be in Cinecenta, but it is way nicer to be outside, uh, except uh, because my amps fail, and I'm likely to lose my voice by the end. But I'll do my best to keep it up. Uh, so my name is Ted Smith, and uh, I'm going to be teaching most of the lectures for this year, although I hope to have uh, a lot of really great guest speakers lined up. Uh, I believe I have... Uh, lined up, uh, for example, Cam, the uh, area manager of Central BC, is going to be here in a couple weeks to talk about pot and politics. Um, the two weeks after that, I got doctors coming, either Dr. Hornby or, I can't pronounce his last name, but I have a doctor from the Netherlands coming. Uh, and they're going to do the two lectures on research and chemistry. Um, actually, wait, before that, I got Phil Finley from Hemp and Company talking. Anyway, uh, I'm going to have a, a lot of guest speakers, uh, which is really uh, fitting because there's more happening now in the industry than ever, and it's a really exciting time to be in it. Uh, today's lecture, though, is uh, on the ancient history of cannabis. As really not much to do with, with today at all. But uh, the ancient history of cannabis to me is something that's really, really important for those of us that know and love the herb today. Because this is not a, a new plant to the human species by any means. This is, and, and I'm not kidding, this is and has been the most important plant that we as humans have ever used or that grows on this planet you know, for our purposes. And it's really astounding all the different purposes that cannabis can be used for in the modern day. And uh, next week's lecture is actually on the Marijuana Tax Act, and I'll, I'll get into a lot of the more modern uses of cannabis. But it's not a plant that we've just used for the last couple of hundred years or a couple of thousands. Cannabis is likely something that we've been using not just for hundreds of thousands of years, but millions and millions of years. In fact, uh, it's hard for us to say when cannabinoids, which uh, we know now is of a THC and CBD, but there's a, a whole family of chemicals that we know of as the cannabinoid family. Well, they came into existence, I think it was about 250 million years ago. And they didn't come into existence in plants or in little critters running around on the ground. Cannabinoids, to our best knowledge, first came into existence in sea squid. These little animal forms that, that live on the surface of the, um, the, the ocean floor that essentially were the first uh, organisms to develop a nervous system so that they could feel around in the water and sort of tell what was food and what wasn't. And the same mechanisms that these cannabinoids were used for in the sea squids are you know, what we use it for when we touch and feel as well, because we have cannabinoids in our endocannabinoid system. And in fact, these cannabinoids that have been used for 250 million years ago, starting in sea, squ sea squirts or sea squids or something, Squirt. sea squirts, have developed in every vertebrae species on the planet. We all have these cannabinoids that we use them for, uh, you know, in a way maintaining uh, homeostasis, it's called technically, or balance in the body and communicating from one cell to the other. If you follow us through the year, you'll learn a lot more about how cells communicate using cannabinoids. And so, it's hard to say when sea squirts and their ancestors kind of developed and started to grow on the land. And it's, but apparently from these sea squirts, you know, we had sort of uh, a divergence uh, towards uh, mammals like us that walk around on the planet and plants 
a lot of uh, living species today kind of can tie themselves back to these early forms of sea life. And so uh, it's impossible for us now, at least with the science we have, to say exactly when the cannabis plants you know, were first uh, uh, apparent on the surface of the, the planet uh, and uh, when we started to consume them. But it's really easy to speculate that it would have been very, very early on in, in our development. You know, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, we would likely have discovered some cannabis plants where we were walking around. And if you know anything about cannabis, uh, it's, it's a very prolific plant, right? So <coughs> the, the plant itself would have grown very easily in fertile regions uh, where there weren't a lot of trees. Because I'm almost thinking that cannabis would have been one of the first trees. It is an ancient tree of life. And it would have been very prolific. And it would have grown very easily in large valleys. And uh, the seeds would spread very far with different birds and animals and stuff. And it would have dominated different areas and, and outgrown everything. The reason that hemp farmers don't need pesticides or herbicides is because it outgrows all the other weeds because it grows so fast and covers out all the light. So it would have done that back in ancient days. So millions of years ago, when we were, you know, not much more than, than uh, uh, well, before apes probably, we would have come across these jungles of cannabis plants. And what we, we would have done first is we would have tried eating them. And the first thing that we would have discovered when we eat them is that they don't taste very good. And that's actually the plant's defense to stop animals from just mowing it down. Because if cannabis tasted really good to eat, we wouldn't know about it now. It would have gone into extinction millions of years ago. So it, it, the plant naturally developed these different flavors to discourage you know, animals like us from just going around and foraging and eating it all when we came across it. But what we would have discovered after the, the, we found out the leaf tastes good was that the seeds, if we wait till the end of the year, the seeds taste really, really good. And they're very, very nutritious for us. In fact, hemp seeds contain all the amino acids, all the essential proteins that you need to sustain yourself. You wouldn't need just about to eat anything else. You could live off of hemp seeds. Now, no one would want to do that. They don't taste very good, really. They're kind of bland and uh, oily tasting, but they're so healthy that uh, you just need a small handful of these hemp seeds in a day and you have all the energy, all the protein that you need to keep yourself going. <coughs> and so we would have discovered very early on in, this, in the fall, there would have been an abundant amount of seeds laying around where these plants grew. And it would have been very easy to save some of these seeds over the winter time. Because as uh, the, the world developed and, and we started to get ice ages, we had to start learning uh, to develop ways to save food over the winter time. And so, uh, you know, we would have learned how to save all sorts of different uh, nuts and berries and fruits and stuff like that. But uh, a lot of seeds would have been very important for us because we would have learned early on that saving hemp seeds uh, is very good for us because we could save them throughout the year. They'd be really good to eat. Eventually we learned to press the oil out of them and we could use the oil for a variety of things as well. But the hemp seed would have been our first and most important use of the hemp plant. But it didn't stop it there because we would have also found these stalks surviving the winter time on the ground, these really hard fibers. And so when we were developing places to live, one of the things that was important to us was, was comfort and finding a nice comfortable floor for the caves or huts or tents or whatever it was that we lived in. And the hemp stalks would have been the most valuable and important sort of way of making your uh, beds comfortable because uh, for, for a number of reasons the fiber would last more than ever. So the first weaving that we did was actually quite likely cannabis stalks that would have been cut down and the whole stalk would have just been weaved together into a mat. And we would have put those mats on our cave floors. We would have put them on our beds and used them for bedding because they, they would break down eventually. You know, when you press them apart, the, the fibers on the outside of the plant would separate from the what's called the herd or the cork in the middle of the plant. So you'd make these mats out of cannabis stalk. You'd put them on the bottom of your tents and they'd just slowly break up and, and the herds would uh, break out and become available. 
which would be great for keeping your house clean. Uh, one of the more uh, uh, common uses of herds in today's modern age is actually in cleaning up stables for, for pigs and horses and, and stuff like that. So uh, <coughs> herds are very absorbent for water and other uh, materials, but they're also uh, antifungal. Uh, so they, they uh, stop uh, funguses from forming. Uh, they also uh, help discourage insects. So even now, people can ha spread pot stalks around the room to keep bed bugs away, for example, because bed bugs and most insects don't like pot stalks. So if you're a messy pot smoker, you might, it might actually help you from getting bed bugs in your place. Yeah. And we would have discovered back in ancient days that the mats using cannabis would have uh, <laughs> discouraged bugs from being in our beds and in our living rooms. They, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't go moldy as quickly, so we wouldn't have to replace them as often. And they would have been you know, fairly comfortable compared to any of the other fibers that would have been easily, easily harvested. And so we have been weaving cannabis probably since before we had the term weaving. Uh, and uh, it really, oh, yeah. uh, if you read some of Terence McKenna's uh, work on the subject, I wish I had one of his quotes available, but he talks about a lot of the language that's used in, in weaving stories and, uh, and, and creating clothing and, uh, and, and fabric. And uh, he's quite convinced that the early fabric makers, which would have been predominantly women, it would have been women that were sharing this knowledge about cannabis and hemp for the most part. Men would have known a little bit, but men were out you know, defending the, the homestead and scavenging for, for materials and food and stuff like that. The women would have been the ones learning how to make hemp foods, how to do stuff with the hemp oil, how to cook with it properly, and how to make you know clothing and fiber and rope. And certainly, you know, rope historically uh, has been made by cannabis for, for millennium. It's been a, you'll hear about it a lot next week in the Marijuana Tax Act uh, uh, lecture. But uh, we would have certainly developed uh, rope and, and uh, clothing and these other uses of the cannabis plant, you know, long before we were smoking it. However, at some point, when somebody was harvesting the hemp plants, they must have realized that they were getting this resin on their fingers. And back in the ancient times, uh, before we had scientists to tell us what to do, they experimented themselves. And it's very likely that the first time anybody got high using cannabis, it was when they were collecting hemp seeds for food, and they got their hands covered in resin, and so they just rubbed that resin off, and they ate it. And that would have really affected them in ways they could not have understood. And so, at that point, that knowledge would have been shared amongst the, the, the tribe or the tribes of people that were communicating and growing cannabis. And it's very difficult to say exactly when that happened. Uh, it, it is known that the first agricultural crops are about 10,000 years old uh, from areas of India. That's where we first started to grow uh, foods and cultivate them and live among tens of thousands of people in one area. So we, we couldn't just go and kill for food anymore and our other materials, we had to grow our own. And they would have known that, that the hemp seed is, is a meat replacement, right? So they would have been growing it for that, but they also would have been growing it for their fibers as well. It wouldn't have been just for the seed. But they would have also known by 10,000 years ago that if you grow certain varieties and, and in the right climates, that you would be able to essentially, you know, create finger hash as we know it today. Or there are other ways to make hash too. There's a lot of really simple methods that are uh, known today uh, that are uh, on the internet. If you watch, there's some really cool videos of making hash in uh, Morocco and just uh, really old methods of basically beating the, the hash off the plant and using it. And uh, it's uh, very certain, uh, again, that we've been doing that and, and making hash and using it uh, for a very long time. Now, I, I generally describe the, the feelings the first person had when they ate hash for the first time. Obviously, uh, I'm, I'm making up uh, some of this. We have no scientific proof of this. Uh, but I, I, I am assured from what I know about science today that the first time that the person uh, or a person ate hash historically, it would have changed the way they thought about themselves and the, the planet from then on but it would not likely have been their first experience of an altered state of consciousness. It's much more likely that magic mushrooms or some other naturally occurring hallucinogenic 
uh, would have been used uh, by these ancient peoples uh, in, in different ways. Much like now, you can look it up online, there's, there's apes and monkeys that eat mushrooms. And uh, actually, there's uh, even more uh, elaborate ways that, that animals you know, uh, will change fruit to make it into alcohol so they can get drunk or, or do other things that have, uh, I, I've, there's the famous story of the, the bear. I don't know if you guys have all seen that uh, movie, The Bear. Well, the bear's eating mushrooms in the movie. And a lot of what we learned about the natural environment was, was actually through watching what other animals did and stuff. And I'm quite certain that, that again, magic mushrooms would have been used and known about as a way to sort of uh, disconnect with this world and touch base with, with another. It was sort of the probably simplistic way they understood it back then. But what they would have done also when they discovered mushrooms and other plants like cannabis is they gave them names. And these names were very powerful back then. This language was just being developed. And if you knew the name and use of a plant, that was a very important thing. And another thing that ancient peoples did and some people today still do is they invoke the name of the god or goddess that they've attributed that plant to when they're both harvesting or uh, consuming that plant. And so in, in ancient times, uh, this knowledge uh, and, and about these plants and the names uh, uh, of the plants and even songs that were, were sang to plants and they were being harvested and used were, were very important traditional ceremonies that would have been developed you know, over millennia. Some of the oldest cave drawings we have around the world actually have mushrooms in them because mushrooms grew on cow shit. When we first started following cows around, we also learned that you could pick the mushrooms off that. And so, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, our, our earliest thoughts uh, of uh, time and space even go back to our use of mind-altering plants. Um, and so when the person uh, first consumed hashish and shared that experience with others in their, their tribe, uh, they would have attributed great power to that plant and, and given it some name or, or other uh, that would have had uh, uh, high you know, esteem or, or great meaning amongst them. And so uh, in later times, um, these terms uh, would have been called angels is one of the uh, terms that Christians uh, used for these sort of uh, plant medicines and the spirits that they said lived in these plants. Because the way ancient peoples learned about these things wasn't that, oh, this plant has chemicals in it that get you high. They understood things in a much more magical way than we do. They, they, they didn't have a, a sense of, of science and they had uh, a, a real sense of awe about the world. They attributed it to divine magical beings. And uh, they, they gave these beings names as well. But some of these beings manifested themselves in the planet, right? Like, you know, uh, Thor manifests himself with the lightning, right? And so a lot of what we learned in the world, we attributed to these other deities. And cannabis was no different. And so uh, it would have been something that when people consume cannabis, uh, they would have been, uh, you know, told a name. Let's say Soma, for example. That this is is the god Soma, and that when you consume this god, much like the, you know, Jesus when he was sharing his, uh, you know, wine and, and bread. When you consume this god, the god enters into you and becomes part of you. And in ancient times, they used to consider whatever you did under the influence of that god not even your responsibility or goddess, I should say, because. You, you were under their influence. You were uh, being uh, instructed by them at times as the beliefs they had. So when you hear about like the Aleutian mysteries, uh, kind of jumping forward a little bit, but in Greek times, you know, they used to have all these prophets and stuff that uh, would uh, ingest uh, various types of hallucinogenics and uh, they would be said to be actually, you know, rep, uh, um, uh, the, the shell in which that god or goddess was actually living at the time they were making their prophecies and stuff it wasn't actually them it, it was but they allowed that god or goddess to enter into them by consuming it and saying the right words and singing the right songs because as many of us know drugs set and setting is really important and you have to be in the right mind state uh, in order to be able to really appreciate it. If you're in the wrong mind state and you have the wrong people around you, you're gonna have a bad trip. It's always been the way it is. And so back in ancient times, they did everything they could when they consumed cannabis or these other drugs to make their set and setting as comfortable 
as beautiful, as, as uh, just you know, uh, relaxing as possible and, and have the best people around them in order for them to have the best experience. And so uh, we began consuming cannabis uh, as, as hashish, uh, most likely back in, in India when we were again in the earlier days of uh, agriculture. But those practices spread around uh, the, the world as civilizations grew. Uh, certainly, uh, by the time Egypt was around, uh, the use of, of hash uh, was very well known. Uh, historically, it's more known as incense, generally speaking, than, than soma. Soma is the, the term used in, in India and that part of the world more often. Uh, but uh, hash was burnt at almost every religious ceremony uh, that, that Egyptians did, I think. And certainly other civilizations burned a lot of hash as well. I'll, I'll touch on some of them. But uh, the Egyptians burned a heck of a lot of hash. There isn't a lot of it in their literature. Um, you'll see it at some points where uh, in some of the uh, pictures, uh, there'll be people holding this long, uh, it, it almost looks like a pipe because there's smoke coming off of the end of it. Uh, but it isn't actually a pipe. It's, it's sort of an incense carrier and they have the incense burning at the end of it, just burning up in the air. Um, and so the way that ancient peoples used to make incense to burn, they didn't actually make uh, uh, pipes uh, at all right away. Um, what they, when they started to burn it, uh, the most common way was using incense burners, where they would have mixed the hash up with a couple of other things to help it burn properly. But they essentially would have made what we call now, still in some parts of the world, Napoli's temple balls which are really just like baseballs of hashish. And they were burning them much like char charcoal bricks. And there was that much hash around that they would uh, you know, have altars, or in some cases, these little handheld hash burners. And uh, they would just keep piling the hash on it. And they would just keep slowly smoldering in the corner of a room, filling the room up with the... Uh, <coughs> filling the room up with smoke which was often uh, described as the presence of God. If you read in uh, a bunch of the Old uh, Testament, uh, God was said to be present in the room when the smoke from the hashish burners was uh, everywhere. And so uh, actually at the museum here in, in uh, uh, Victoria, we've got this Assyrian temple, uh, that, or sorry, altar, that's about three and a half feet tall, a couple feet wide, they don't know what it's there for or what it was used for historically. At least they, they haven't admitted it if they do know uh, because it, it wasn't made for blood because it's a bull. And back when they did uh, blood sacrifices, they wanted the blood to, to wash away so that it wouldn't make people sick. If the blood pooled up, uh, it, it wasn't a good sacrifice altar at all. So uh, this altar that's at the uh, uh, museum here uh, is built the opposite way so that uh, as the incense burns it will fall off but it's still built so that the you know you can pile these balls of hashish up and, and use them as smoke and so uh, certainly the Egyptians used uh, hash uh, to smoke they likely ate it as well but they also used it topically um, as many of us know here and we'll describe this in our uh, uh, other lectures Cannabis uh, can be absorbed topically as well. The cannabinoids are, are muscle relaxants, painkillers, and have a, a number of different effects. Um, and if, you know, and in theory, if done properly, if you use you know uh, a lot of uh, or high THC uh, oils and you uh, saturate your brain with them, in theory, there will be a discernible psychoactive effect. You won't get as stoned as you will eating a cookie, but you will notice it. And so. The Egyptians, uh, in fact, uh, in some ways may have uh, perfected some of these what they call unguents that they made. The, the Egyptians are right into all these kinds of oils and stuff that they put out throughout your body. And so uh, if you look back in Egyptian uh, hieroglyphics, you can find this little ball or little uh, pile of something on the top of their heads. And, uh, a lot of uh, images around people that are dying, they would do this at, at ceremonies. And in this case, we have uh, a couple of dancers and singers that have it on the top of their head. You know, I'll show it around a bit more here. Um, you also see there's this sort of gold band that's uh, got a, a um, sort of a, a serrated edge on it there. Well, that gold band would be used to kind of hold the hash together. And uh, this is sort of depicts the beginning of a ceremony. 
because uh, it was usually girls that were the singers and dancers. Uh, there's lots of these pictures uh, where uh, you, you can see them uh, with the things on their heads. Um, Ed, behind I, you. Pardon? Behind you. Gentlemen, behind you. Oh, oh sorry, Carl. So uh, the, the gold band was actually meant to try to hold the hash together as long as possible because uh, the girls would start singing and dancing and as they did that, this little pile of hash would start melting. And while they did their ceremony, it would just melt into their head. And uh, they also had these gold bands around their head. You see where this gold band is in their hair? Well, the gold band was made to help saturate the top of their head with the oil as much as possible so it wouldn't drip into their eyes or down their neck and it would kind of uh you know give them uh our music and stuff like this as well and so uh it was very common that uh, everybody would have a little pile of hash on their head uh when they started these parties back then and that that would be you know uh, a really uh, uh common and and fun thing to do um how much time do I got? Is anybody going to watch? I don't know, but the battery's dying. Where's the 335. 335, okay. Um, so, uh, I mentioned uh, Soma. Um, my friend Chris Bennett has taught me a lot of this about cannabis. He's written three books. The last one here, Cannabis and the Soma Solution, really has summed it up better than ever. He's, his first book, uh, Green Gold, The Tree of Life, Marijuana and Magic and Religion, uh, was written in 95. It was his uh, but uh, that it was the incense uh, of uh, an, an anointing oil of Christians. And I'll get to that in a second, but I want to go back to Soma because uh, Soma has been uh, known about for thousands of years, but apparently no one has had Soma now for 16, 1700 years in, in India. And uh, India to this day is still used religiously in, in, uh, by uh, a number of groups. Uh, and uh, it's, some of them will describe it as Soma, but they have you know, other names for it now. And uh, first though, I'm, I'm going to read a passage from the Rig Veda. Um, and, uh, what, and I guess you know, the reason Chris wrote this book is because there is some discussion about whether Soma meant magic mushrooms or cannabis. Um, a uh, botanist, uh, Gordon Wasson, uh, wrote uh, uh, about the magic mushroom actually being Soma. And uh, a lot of people around the world bought it without actually looking more into his research or looking into the Rig Veda. And so what Chris Bennett's done is he's proven that in, in history, most commonly when the term Soma was used, it was cannabis that was being used in the drink. But over time, uh, Soma did not always mean cannabis drinks, partly because of scarcity issues and uh, it seems as though in some times and places actually uh, mushrooms are more readily available than, than cannabis or were possibly used uh, as soma or soma might have meant at some times and places anything that got you high and so there's the rig vedas were written over thousands of years uh, um, and were oral tradition before they were written as well but uh, this is uh, um, and they actually sometimes describe it as Homa as well. But uh, this is an old poem about uh, Homa from the Rig Vedas. It says, Homa is golden green. Homa is tall. Homa has roots, stems, and branches. Homa has a pliant stem. Homa is fragrant. Homa grows on the mountains, swift spreading apart from many paths to the gorge and the abysses on the ranges. Homa can be pressed. Homa has healing properties. Homa has aphrodisiac properties. Homa increases strength. Homa stimul stimulates alertness and awareness. Homa can be consumed without negative side effects. Homa is most nutritious for the soul. And Homa bestows spiritual wisdom. Again, the Rig Vedas aren't exactly poems. Uh, these are just kind of ancient historical uh, sayings and texts that were passed down. And uh, the reason that there's been a discussion about what Soma and Homa was, was because um, about 17 or 1600 years ago, uh, they stopped using Soma in India, but they didn't stop using cannabis, and that's created some confusion. But what happened was the religious traditions in India, the Brahmins as they were called, I think, 
became very powerful, influential, and wealthy in India by controlling what was used in religious ceremonies. And they came up with all these crazy rules that Soma had to be used at morning rituals, at afternoon rituals, at evening rituals. If, uh, there was monthly rituals, you had to use it. At annual rituals, you had to use mass amounts of it. And that would be fine if everyone would be able to go get Soma and make it whenever they wanted. But unfortunately, over time, these religious leaders in India said that Soma was something that had to be consecrated by the priests. And so you would walk in there with a bowl of bang, which is cannabis cooked in milk, and uh, it, it, once you got in front of the priest, the priest would say, okay, a few words, and now you've got Soma, and you can use it in these religious ceremonies. But you would have had to pay the priest a lot of money in order for him to claim that to be Soma. And they were making tons of money and becoming very, very wealthy off of this religious system based entirely around cannabis. And so at a certain point, the population got fed up with it. They're like, we can make this cannabis concoction whenever we want. We don't need you to consecrate it as Soma. And uh, we're just going to uh, you know, denounce your religion entirely. And most of them turned over to Buddhism instead and rejected all the materialism that this old religion in India stood for. And uh, that's why Soma stopped being used. But a lot of these Buddhists just kept using cannabis they just de didn't need to go have a priest tell them it was good for them in order to do so. And so uh, <laughs> cannabis, again, is still used in, in India, uh, but uh, not so throughout the rest of the world. Um, I do a lecture on the history of prohibition. Uh, actually, I think that's my first lecture next, sem next semester. So I'll, I'll save a lot of my Christian bashing for that one because they're really <laughs> responsible for prohibition. But ironically, the Christians historically used cannabis in all of its forms as much if not more than any other religion and you can read that in the Old Testament right from the beginning of the Old Testament even through to the New Testament I should say cannabis is talked about and used in all of its different forms in the very beginning of the Bible you can see how uh, God uh, created all of the, the, the plants and uh, animals for mankind in fact there's even a reference to all seed bearing herbs. There are not a lot of seed-bearing herbs, people, but cannabis is one of them. And so <laughs> that reference there could be understood as a reference to cannabis because there's also a reference right there that says that these seeds can be eaten for meat. And that is, again, uh, in my understanding and many others, a reference to the use of cannabis for meat. I forgot to get into it uh, in terms of using for Ice Age survival. Uh, but I'm quite convinced that mm -hmm. cannabis was used to survive many dark ages or ice ages because it's got a short growing season and you'd be able to save it up for a few winters. Even if you didn't get a good growing season one year, you might be able to the next. And it's a mass uh, bio producer produces a, a ton of seeds for one seed. You get pounds and pounds of seeds in the fall. And it's so prolific, it, it, it would have been used very much as, as food. Uh, for ancient people when, when meat was very scarce. And so uh, <coughs> certainly other references to cannabis exist in the Old Testament when they talk about incense. Uh, that can be proven in, in some ways, but the most uh, certain reference in the Old Testament is the reference to cannabossum in the recipe that Moses uses for the anointing oil. When Moses is taught the recipe in, in Exodus uh, in the Bible, uh, God tells them seven things to throw in uh, a pot, basically, to make uh, anointing oil for religious purposes. He needed seven pounds of cannabis for one dose of this anointing oil. And uh, it was mostly olive oil and a few other herbs and things mixed in to either help it absorb or smell better. And so this anointing oil was not only used by Moses but it was the anointing oil that Jesus used when he healed the so-called lepers uh, that were outside of cities with skin diseases and a whole host of other problems. As we know now, cannabis is an antibiotic, antifungal, antioxidant, anti-carcinogenic. It, it kills skin diseases. It regenerates skin 
Uh, we've seen it at the Cannabis Buyers Club. I've sold medicine in Victoria for 17 years. Uh, we have skin products. I've seen it do a number of incredible things. And certainly, uh, back then, the term lepers described anybody with a skin infection. It wasn't just leprosy, although that was a problem. Cannabis would have helped with, not cured. But uh, certainly, uh, cannabis uh, was being used by Jesus to uh, heal uh, these various lepers. And uh, it's, it's uh, very well known uh, by, by uh, many people that that anointing oil uh, couldn't have been made with, with anything else in order to have those healing properties because the other ingredients that Moses was told to use in his anointing oil uh, did not contain cannabis at all. And so this anointing oil was not only really good for healing, but as I sort of said earlier, you know, under the right circumstances, you can have a euphoric high from the topical use of cannabis, really high grade cannabis if you're putting it on a lot. And so they figured that out early on. They probably actually pressed the hemp seed oil out and used hemp seed earlier, but eventually they used grape seed oil because it was just easier to get for them. And so not only the ancient uh, Christians and, and Jews, but there's a lot of ancient uh, religions that had a uh, anointing ceremony and, and the initiation into the priesthood. The anointing ceremony would usually be the first of seven stages to become a high priest. And it was the first stage in most ancient traditions. And so uh, um, in ancient times, uh, when they built their, their towns, they would put the temple uh, facing the south and the, there would be a big square where the people would be able to gather so that they could be told uh, you know, or, or gather for religious ceremonies so that the, the leaders would be able to, you know, update them on different things that were happening or what they were doing, you know, marriages, deaths, births, all these different announcements would, would happen at the top of the south-facing stairs. So they would have a temple at the top of these stairs where the priests would hold their private ceremonies. So what they would do when they would, in, would initiate uh, people into the Jewish priesthood, they would cover them in white robes, Back then, they didn't shave their heads or their beards either, so they'd be, you know, totally hippied out and have all this hair all over them. And they pour this vat of oil, again, the seven pounds of cannabis cooked into this oil, and they would sing all these songs. Again, they'd be in this room burning all sorts of hash as incense, so there'd be smoke everywhere. They'd probably get them to drink a little bit as well to loosen them up. But then they'd slowly pour this vat of oil over their head, and they'd have wraps around their head, you know, cloth and stuff to try to absorb as much of this oil as they could so it would stay there, stay in their hair, so it wouldn't just drain off of them so they could keep absorbing as many cannabis uh, or can can cannabinoids uh, as possible. And so uh, they would, again, these sing these songs and twist these guys around a little bit so they're all nice and high and uh, cover them in oil. And then at noon, they would push them out to the top of the stairs so they could announce to the tribe, hey, we have this new initiate into the priesthood. So everybody be out there looking up at this guy who would be glowing, okay, it's the noon sun. He's covered in, in oil, like olive oil, right, predominantly, a bit of green in it, but the, the olive oil would make them shine and certainly the intoxicating effects of cannabis being introduced into the priesthood, uh, the smoke in the room, you know, the songs, you know, it would be a little overwhelming for some of them, but they would be glowing. They would, you know, have a spirit about them that would be different than they'd ever had before. And again, that would be attributed to the spirit of the Lord entering into them, you know, through the, the smoke that would appear in the temple. And, uh, and, and so, you know, from that day forward, that person would be able to speak as a representative of the Lord because the Lord, you know, had entered into them through this plant that, that they had consumed. And so these religious ceremonies weren't just Christian, though. These ceremonies, you know, really existed all throughout the ancient world. Uh, they all used cannabis and understood it to be the tree of life. And uh, if you look back at a lot of different uh, civilizations, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, uh, the Assyrians, they all had a, a stylized tree of life. Uh, and by that I mean, you know, a, a representative uh, artistic representation of the cannabis plant that didn't really look like the cannabis plant. Now, if you've ever tried to uh, draw a pot plant, it's not that easy. 
it certainly would have been not have been that easy back when you were carving out of stone. And so they came up with more simplistic uh, versions of this tree of life that did over time become more and more intricate. And so by the time of the Assyrians, uh, the, the tree of life was uh, very common. The, the king, the Babylonian king as well, uh, would, would be said to have a garden with you know, plants and animals from you know, the farthest kingdoms, but their most sacred plant, the one that they would, would love to be around and they would go garden and tend it themselves, would be the tree of life. You know, over and over, the tree of life is is referenced to in these, you know, ancient uh, writings, and uh, it's it's certainly uh, something that I and many other people are convinced that it was referred to not only for its religious purposes, but again through its its food purposes and through its use of, of hemp and clothing as well, because uh, as we became more civilized, we began to manufacture more things. And as I said earlier, you know, the earliest fabric that we made, you know, the earliest mats would have been just cannabis plants woven together. Well, canvas, the root word of cannabis is cannabis, you know, uh, and so the earliest weaving was all done like that. And it's not just that, the other uh, ancient use of cannabis is for paper. Uh, I think it was like 3,000 years ago or something like that. In China, they developed a technique to take the, the fiber uh, from hemp and uh, basically using a, a simple screen, uh, they were able to make uh, parchment paper. It was the first paper ever made around the world. And uh, they're still making hemp paper in China now. We just can't get it here because they don't have trees to harvest in China. Every tree in China right now is planted there by human hands. And so uh, they, they can't harvest them for, for uh, materials like we do here. That's why they make uh, all sorts of things, like that signboard that I got over there. That's actually a hemp uh, fiber, uh, hemp plywood over there, hemp glued together, because they make uh, a lot of wood and, and insulation. I'll bring next week uh, my hemp insulation and stuff, because uh, in, in Asia, they've actually been using hemp for building materials and, and clothing. Uh, one of the other things, I'm kind of slip into modern times, but linen is actually hemp. There is no linen plant. They started selling linen in China after reefer madness because we wouldn't buy hemp anymore so they, they called it fine linen so the only linen that isn't made out of hemp in the world is actually from ireland ireland linen is actually made out of flax but every other linen that you buy is actually mostly hemp and uh but they just won't sell it like that but certainly you know in china in particular more uh for its industrial purposes hemp has a, a really long uh history um not so much re religiously, ironically, although uh, the oldest archaeological discovery of cannabis is in China. There's, I think, a 6,000-year-old mummy that they uh, discovered uh, that had a couple of pounds of pot on them. Not just a little bit, but he had a couple of pounds of pot. Um, there was some hope the seeds would have been viable because there's some decent seeds even in it. So it's very seedy pot. Uh, but it was uh, a burial for a shaman. He had a whole bunch of other artifacts and herbs around him. It wasn't just someone that died walking down the road because they just robbed some guy. Uh, <laughs> they, they, there was a, a very intentional burial. And the, the cannabis was the most common plant material buried with him. And so ancient Chinese people you know, used it and used it as medicine. They still use it as medicine today though, actually. And so it's hard to say whether they, they used it sort of religiously to, to have even more um, But in China and in, in Asia, to this very day, hemp is known for being able to, to heal or help the symptoms of a, a wide variety of, of medical problems. And that's just eating the seed or the leaf, uh, not smoking or using hash. That's just, uh, again, more, more industrial purposes. Um, but. Uh, Certainly, um, you know, around the time of Jesus, uh, cannabis was used as incense and anointing oil in most of the known world, with, with again, the possible exception of China. That would have been the only really developed part of the world that wasn't using uh, cannabis. But uh, there's every indication, there's even evidence now to prove that Norse people uh, up in Scandinavia were growing and using hemp. Uh, thousands of years ago. It may have been something that was introduced to them 
uh, from people in the Mediterranean and on sailboats and stuff, but they took it and they grew it for fiber. Again, uh, for rope, for sailboats, uh, the use of cannabis historically uh, was very, very important. And so that would have been uh, for you know uh, early discoverers or, or explorers, uh, the most important use of it in many ways. Um, what time do I got now? Five minutes. I got five minutes. Okay, 420 is coming on quick. Okay, um, I could talk a lot about the history of this plant. I love it a lot. And even though it's been buried, there is more information and more to learn about this plant and its history than any other plant that there is. And so uh, thank you all for listening to the ancient history of cannabis. Uh, I kind of left off around the time of Jesus because that's around the time prohibition starts kicking in. So next semester, I'll, I'll sort of pick off where I, I pick up where I left off there today. Uh, and uh, next week, I'm going to get into the Marijuana Tax Act and, and a lot more about the uses of hemp and why we're facing prohibition today. Um, and again, I got lots of great speakers. I think the next four weeks after that, probably five, I got guest speakers. So it's maybe the first year I have more guest speakers uh, than, than I speak to lectures myself. Uh, if the weather's good, we'll be back out here again next week because this is way better than Cinecenta. So I hope <laughs> you're all able to figure that out. But uh, 420 is going to start soon. I'm going to pack up for that. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Have a great day. And smoke it you There's a war going on out there. People are being arrested all the time for growing, smoking, and selling cannabis. The one we know the most is Mark Emery. Mark uh, um, might be a, a bit of a loudmouth schmuck at times, but uh, he, at the same time, has done more to make cannabis available and teach people about it than pretty much anybody else out there. And he's so aggressive oh, that he just more sold that. seeds around the world until yeah. the American government arrested him. Oh, okay. Him. And they gave him five right. years in jail. He's paying the price. And he should be out by next July, hopefully earlier. But uh, the very late, latest next July, Mark will be out. And uh, certainly throughout the year, uh, while he is still in jail, yeah. he'll be the one that okay. will bring up uh, the most. But there are a lot of other people that we don't know, that we've never met, uh, that have been caught growing and selling this pot. And uh, they're sitting in jail rotting away right now. And so uh, every week we have 42 seconds of silence to pay some respect to those people that are suffering because of this war on drugs. So if you could please uh, join me here. I'll give you a countdown to three. And then 42 seconds of silence for the victims of the drug war starting, please, in three, two, one. Thank you very much for that, folks. And uh, yeah, again, it is so awesome being back here in the quad with you all. We're going to have a really, really fun year here. And uh, I guess before I get to the, the real fun parts, I'm going to talk about the, the other serious thing that we do. Um, I teach a free non-credit lecture series on the history of cannabis. Um, I've actually written a book, Anthology 101, The History and Uses of Cannabis. And uh, it's taken me 17 years to put it together, but uh, got it out just last year and uh, it's something that covers really most of the ancient historical uses of cannabis and, and hemp and uh, we just did our, our first lecture of the year um, we do a lecture from 3 to 4 on Wednesdays just before the 420 um, I'm doing them uh, outside of the sub on the lawn when the weather's nice like today it kind of sucks going indoors so next week hopefully the weather will be nice and the lecture's on the, the uh, Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 and uh, the lecture after that is going to be on pot and politics. I have the organizer of the Sensible BC campaign here locally coming. And then the, the two weeks after that, I got a couple doctors to come talk about research in cannabis. And I think actually I have more guest speakers coming this year uh, to do the lectures than I'm even going to do myself. And so uh, the lectures are normally in the Cine Center.